So welcome everyone. Uh, the effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, IAPON, the Training for Peace Program, and the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. Please welcome you to this webinar on the mandate renewal of the United Nations mission in South Sudan. My name is Cedric de Koening, and I'm a research professor at NUPI, the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, and I'll be your host today. We have a, a fantastic panel. Uh, in addition to the authors of our report that I'll introduce in a moment, we also are honored to have with us uh, the special representative of the Secretary General to South Sudan and the head of the mission, UNMIS, uh, Mr. Nicholas Haysom. And we also have Ambassador Akwai Bonamalwal, who is the South Sudanese permanent representative to the United Nations with us. And so we'll start with an introduction of the report. This is the Iapon report entitled The United Nations Mission in South Sudan 2022, Risk and Opportunities in an Uncertain Peace Process. And this is the report which uh, Iapon has undertaken, uh, looking specifically to informing the mandate renewal process. Uh, the mandate of the UN mission in South Sudan will be up for renewal in March. And so in to, to introduce the report, I'm going to uh, hand over soon to Adam Day, who is the Director of Programs at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research, and my NUPI colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew E. Or Chi, who is a Senior Research Fellow with us and also heads our Training for Peace program. And unfortunately, Liesl Kumalo, the other author of report, uh, was not able to, to join us, but I'm sure Adam and, and Andrew will do a good job of, of introducing the report shortly before um, SRSG Haysom and Ambassador Malwal will have an opportunity to, to comment on the report. So we are, of course, facing a, a situation in South Sudan where we have a election due in 2023 um, that is uncertain in terms of whether uh, everything that needs to be in place will be in place in time, including potentially some constitutional changes. And these are some of the elements that Adam and Andrew and Liesel has looked at in their, in their report. And uh, so let me hand over to Adam to kick us off. Adam, if you can uh, start to introduce the report and then I'll hand over to Andrew. So over to you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. You can hear me? Very well. Great. Um, well, first, um, it's very nice to see Excellency Ambassador Malwal and SRSG Haysom, and, and I will get out of the way as quickly as possible to allow the, the main show of you two speaking. Um, but just a few points really on this report that we've done. This is the second EPON report we've done on South Sudan. The first was in late 2018 based on field research, and then this most recent mini one focused more narrowly on the mandate renewal. And really to a certain extent, both reports confront the same question, which is, is South Sudan really transitioning out of war into a viable peace? What does that mean for the UN? Um, and the transition into peace is, in many respects, a harder question than the outbreak of war. In, in, in late 2013, when South Sudan civil war broke out, the escalation into large-scale violence was clear, and the actions of the Security Council were, were fairly straightforward. The Council ended the UN state building mandate, it shifted the focus from state support to protection and put in place a, a four prong mandate, protection of civilians, facilitating humanitarian delivery, monitoring human rights and supporting a peace process. And through the signature of the 2015 peace agreement and the 2018 peace agreement, the mission has more or less had the same mandate now with a greater emphasis on the peace process as it's gained momentum. But today the situation is significantly different. Whereas only a couple of years ago, UNMIS was administering protection of civilian sites for roughly 100,000 people. Today, it's redesignated all but one of those sites without a major incident. Um, and the country is now much more focused on the upcoming elections, implementation of the revitalized agreement, and really dealing with a quite unstable region. Um, but, but really the risk of all out civil war appears to be much less than it was even just a few years ago. And so our, our report really asked the question, what should the Security Council consider when it's remandating on this for this year? And it focuses on, on two issues, the, the protection of civilians issue and how the UN works with, with regional actors to support the peace process. And on, on 
POC protection of civilians, the transition out of administering the POC sites has gone, I'd say, remarkably well. And when we were there in 2018, many experts suggested that redesignating the sites, turning them over to the government, could trigger significant violence. And today, even though many risks remain, and especially in the Malakal area, which hasn't been redesignated, uh, we should emphasize that the other redesignations have actually gone very smoothly, not without incident, but without major, the kind of major escalation that um, some were, were warning. And I think it should be recognized as, as a success. Um, one of the underlying assumptions is that shutting down the POC sites and redesignating them would free up more unmissed assets for more mobile forms of protection moving around the country. We found that it wasn't quite so zero sum. It's not that you can take an unmissed soldier off a static post and send them straight out on patrol, but we have found the mission has managed to push out and do much more mobile forms of protection in the last even year. It's established far more temporary operating bases, and those may have helped reduce tensions and prevent escalation in some areas. And, and temporary operating bases aren't the panacea, but they are a practice that appears to help the mission more effectively reach out to more of South Sudan. And I think it's important to quickly highlight a shift in the UN and UNMIS's thinking over the last few years. When I was first working on UNMIS quite a few years ago, um, there was a clear differentiation between intercommunal violence and political violence, between kind of the different mission assets and approaches that would be used. And today, I think there's a clear recognition that violence is interconnected. 80% of cattle in, in the peripheries are owned by power brokers in, in the major cities. There's no such thing as purely local violence. Um, and I think the concept of subnational violence is a, is a useful one that the mission's adopted. Um, and I think this more systemic understanding of risks and more holistic response is a really positive step by, by the mission. And I think that the POC recommendations in our report recognize the progress that UNMIS has made. It suggests that really the main emphasis for the coming period should be to build on the contingency planning that the mission has established some, some very good capacities there, being ready for a range of different scenarios around an uncertain peace process, preparing for elections related increases in violence, but also recognizing that South Sudan may be entering a new phase in the peace process that may require a different orientation. So that flexibility, I think, is important. On the peace process, um, I think the important starting point is to recognize that the UN is not a signator or a guarantor of the agreement. It really has a relatively limited supporting role in many respects. And this makes the UN largely behind the scenes supporting actors like EGAD and the AU, both of which have been really focused on other crises elsewhere in the region for the last couple of years. And it's worth really noting that EGAD today is not what it was in 2011 when UNMIS was first formed. Today, the organization is much more of a loose constellation of largely competing states in the region, not a cohesive regional organization that's able to take collective decisions easily. And it makes it a difficult partner, especially with the crises in Ethiopia and Sudan taking place. This has really practical effects. Um, EGAD is responsible for appointing key leadership roles in support of the peace agreement. And some of the delays in appointments over the last couple of years have had um, it had some impact on, on moving the peace process. So this gap in support to the, to the uh, peace process from a regional standpoint means potentially greater roles for the AU and possibly for the UN. And I'd say this is most evident around the elections. Uh, a 2021 electoral assessment by the UN proposed a pretty ambitious package of support to the elections, including technical advisory, logistics support, the usual uh, that you, you'd expect from the UN support package. It's really difficult to, to overestimate how complex and challenging elections in South Sudan will be. It's an enormous and inaccessible terrain. There's still pockets of insecurity. There's lack of local capacities. And there's still uncertainty over the parties, real commitment to moving forward in, in some respects. But this may be, I think, where the UN's value added is most clear and where its work with the AU on issues like political space and human rights might be really very important over the coming year. And really just to flag, and, and I'm really glad we have SRG Hasem here, is that the peace process also envisages a constitutional process before the elections. This is a, a major issue to be confronted. And this could be a fundamental turning point for South Sudan to address those deep issues around power sharing, center periphery relationships, reshaping the political settlement into a more stable arrangement. But on the other hand, a constitutional process could be uh, very destabilizing. It could open the door to spoilers, more divisions, greater risk.
risks. We see this, though, as an opportunity for the UN, especially given SRSG Hastings really extraordinary expertise on constitution making, to play a supportive role in the constitutional process. And, and we hope that that could be um, a, an important part of, of the UN's work, possibly. Um, and almost finally, um, it's worth noting that the UNMIS was once the UN's largest state building, with a real emphasis on supporting state capacities. When, when South Sudan was the world's newest country in 2011 to 2013, there may be a push for UNMIS to return to some of that more full-throated state building mode uh, once the, the revitalized agreement gets into a new phase. And, and we recognize the importance of improving governance, um, but our two EPON reports really uh, would suggest quite a lot of caution before returning into that full-throated state building mindset. And in fact, if you look at our 2018 report, it found that some of the, the UN's early state building had some real negative impacts in some of the earlier days of UNMIS. So I just want to, uh, to flag there are a lot of things that aren't covered in, in our reports, particularly our most recent one. Um, and I want to acknowledge one, one important issue, which is the floods that have affected more than 700,000 people. South Sudan this year. This is the worst flooding in 60 years. It shows the direct impact of climate change on stability. Countries like South Sudan, and we really hope that climate security is an area the Security Council takes up much more seriously in the future, looking to really support countries undergoing some of the worst impacts of that. So I wanted to just close with one of the um, concepts that is in both EPON reports. And, and I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about South Sudan, living in Sudan on and off from 20, 2008 to 2011, working on the analysis and planning for UNMIS before the mission was set up and leading these two EPONs, I've got a book coming out about South Sudan. And if anything that I've learned through this is it's made me very aware of the hubris and the limitations of the UN, my, myself very much included, in designing approaches for South Sudan from the outside, especially designing approaches from New York. There is no boilerplate approach to UNMIS that will, that will address the very fluid and complex systems of governance in South Sudan. And I think really one of the best things the Security Council can do is provide the UN and the leadership of UNMIS with the greatest amount of flexibility to react to new circumstances, allowing it to shift support where it's most needed, react to evolving situations on the ground over the next year. I think Cedric's work on adaptive peace building is exactly the kind of idea that's needed for South Sudan. And certainly I'd say the UN couldn't have better leadership at this moment for, for UNMIS than, than think Hasem. Um, we really hope the Security Council sees the value in giving UNMIS a flexible mandate so he can shape the mission's response over the coming year. Uh, I'm really honored to be joined by Ambassador Malwa also, who, uh, whose views I'm sure will be really important in understanding what's needed over the next year. Um, and, and really, if there's anything I can take away from working and researching in South Sudan, it's that the South Sudanese have a far more sophisticated understanding of their country than someone like me will ever have. And the best thing I can do is, is really stop talking and listen to uh, them. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you very much, Adam. And, and before I go to Andrew, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you're most welcome to, to start reflecting, uh, have a discussion in the chat, pose questions in either the chat or in the Q&A. We'll pick those up later in the, in the Q&A discussion. Um, so, Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Cedric, and thank you, colleagues and uh, participants who are, are watching online. I think I just I have three three points or three sort of uh, takeaways for myself, uh, sort of following up from what Adam has has said. Uh, and the first thing really is about in the report we sort of highlight this idea of the AU um, stepping in where maybe EGAD uh, isn't there. Uh, and I guess the broader question for me is is really about this idea of synergy. How does the AU step in? and support this idea of synergy with the EGA to, to complement one another, uh, and particularly uh, in terms of uh, not just the mediation, but also just to move the peace process forward. But also the wider sort of aspect of resources. Uh, so how do a, the AU and EGA work together to share resources, but also complement uh, what the UN is already doing um, on, the, on the ground, but also to, to sustain, uh, I guess, uh, and transfer and build institutional mechanisms that are needed uh, to move uh, the situation forward. And, and then really another point, which is what Adam already highlighted, which is the second point, which is about regional dynamics. Um, as Adam has highlighted, the focus now is really, or has been for the last few months on Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, but what does this mean for other regions? Not just South Sudan, but also I'm thinking here of Abyei, 
uh, and what are the wider implications and so how does uh, the, the African Union, but also EGAD work together really in this area to sort of support uh, not just South Sudan, but the wider dynamics that impact South Sudan here as well. And I think while we try to explore some of that in the report, it, it's it's one of those things where you try and find the best solutions. But as Adam has highlighted, some of these solutions will come from the South Sudanese uh, people themselves. Um, and And so really those two points are what I would like to try and highlight from this report because I think they're important uh, but they're also important to move I would argue things forward um, but I will leave it here and then and, and pass it on to the participants as well for their input. Thank you very much Adam and Andrew and, and Liesl for for the study and then I'm going to go over to SRSG Haysom and Ambassador Malwal so Funk uh, if you have any comments on the report, but but perhaps more importantly, views on, on what you see as the priorities for, for UNMIS uh, over the coming year. Over to you, uh, SRSG uh, Just uh, unmute, please. Um, excellent, there you are. Thank you, thank you, Cedric. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to engage on this important question of the UNMIS mandate. Can I just say uh, right uh, at the inception that I think the report is excellent and it gives us uh, significant assistance and pointers uh, on the way forward. Uh, and then let me also say that I think there's a remark in the report, but uh, or I've read it elsewhere, is that I don't think the mission needs its mandate to be completely rewritten. I think we're almost uh, at the stage where the mandate fits is fit for purpose and it needs tweaking, I think, in response to the changing conditions uh, outside. Uh, let me give you my kind of uh, set speech, uh, which tries to look more globally at the uh, mandate. Um, for the last year, since the last mandate renewal, we've been consolidating, in essence, a pivot uh, away from a peacekeeping mission and anchored in static protection to an operation that meets protection needs with our greatest, with an increasing focus on the primacy of politics in identifying durable solutions to the conflict. And as such, we've seen the mandate, as it were, not come a full circle, but significantly alter from its initial state building uh, mandate of 2011. The three-year strategic vision called for by the Security Council has enabled UNMIS to bridge the elements of its work in a more coherent way, um, uh, more properly integrating protection, stabilization, peace building, and so on. It's given us a longer-term perspective uh, and allowed us to anchor our planning going forward beyond the kind of uh, single mandate cycle uh, and a limited category focusing on IDPs in UN camps. We've taken uh, that injunction from the Security Council and built what we call a five track program, which essentially means working on the peace process itself, securing the benchmarks identified by the parties uh, in the joint framework. Secondly, building and projecting peace and security to enable uh, that political stabilization. Thirdly, uh, engaging at local level uh, conflicts to minimize the possibilities of enduring uh, conflict between communities uh, and what is sometimes referred to as intercommunal conflict. Fourthly, building up accountability, rule of law and human rights as a critical aspect, uh, not only of our work, but of institution building in South Sudan, and on that score, I just need to emphasize the warning uh, that the World Bank had given in its study on fragile, uh, uh, on rebuilding fragile states, which is that institutions take a long time. And I think uh, we are painfully aware that building rule of law institutions is, uh, as the World Bank study suggested, a 20 to 40 year uh, uh, cycle. Um, it's against this backdrop that we've really had to engage in the revitalized peace agreement. And I think we would, uh, not to be churlish, 
acknowledge that there's been relatively significant progress across a number of political areas in establishing executives and legislatures and uh, some of the institutions set out in the peace agreement. Uh, and although we have consistently welcomed that progress in the Security Council and elsewhere, we've also been at pains to point out that the progress has been slow and uh, has been insufficient to really anchor uh, a peace process. And the critical gaps remain, as you're aware, in the and the chapter two, which deals with the unified forces, um, and certainly in regard to some of the constitution making requirements um, and agreement on a command structure, as well as some of the accountability mechanisms. We've been challenged really uh, in regard to our emphasis on the peace agreement, uh, but we continue to see the peace agreement as the only viable framework to which both parties have committed. And if we didn't have the peace agreement, those of us who worked in mission settings without peace agreements, we'd have to create one. Um, I think that the concern that many analysts have is that increasingly the peace agreement is being applied to a situation in which there is asymmetrical power relations. And it is the asymmetrical power relations with which we need to engage uh, rather than taking our foot off the, the pressure, the accelerator pedal on the peace agreement itself. I want to say that I think matching our switch, our pivot in strategy has been a really significant drop in fatalities and casualties. If that is, and it has been often stated as our primary purpose, then it has to be, there has to be some recognition that what we've been trying to do, we've effectively done. We've been a bit coy about claiming uh, credit for it because we know in South Sudan, uh, these indicators are fragile, and because reverses are possible uh, one week to the next. Uh, but having said that, it's certainly been an indication that I think at least some of our strategies, the temporary operating bases, the more integrated approach to finding uh, solutions at the community level uh, of, uh, of making our peacekeepers more effective through the supplementation of civilian mechanisms, uh, leaving behind not just the trash of a TOB, but uh, agreements, intercommunal agreements uh, in place, uh, has, been, has been overall successful. Um, we would acknowledge, though, that uh, the year ahead is likely to see an intensification of tension and competition between the political, political players. Uh, in South Sudan, and uh, we don't think uh, that there's any room for hubris or um, um, uh, backpatting uh, until we can get through at least what I believe will be a testing and difficult year. Uh, let me just say that we have uh, certainly taken uh, great effort to point out to the government that it bears the primary responsibility to protect civilians. And that is because of a tendency to shift that burden to UNMIS when it's uncomfortable, uh, but to assert it when not. And so we have been consistently consistent in pointing out that the primary responsibility to protect civilians rests with the government. But within that, quite frankly, a considerable amount of our work resources and attention goes into building durable solutions at the community level. Uh, we've had uh, 17 areas where we've had significant peace agreements, which have given rise to uh, over 40 local peace agreements. We've established 125 operating bases in the last year. Um, and we've been able, I think, to establish uh, agreements between communities in some of the most insecure areas across the country. Um, having said that, though, I think we would need to recognize that our agreements are also fragile, that the agreements reached this year don't necessarily last into next year, 
and we need to constantly reassess the or assess the impact we're having. Also, uh, in regard to our local level uh, peace brokerage. Um, we have placed a greater emphasis on support to the South Sudan National Police, and I think we can expect the mission to continue to do so, uh, together with the emphasis on rule of law institutions. We found the establishment of mobile courts to be much more effective than they sound. And that's because of the power of example. Um, a a well-selected uh, case against a local power broker can have a much greater effect than the mobile court, which is inevitably limited in how much uh, judicial work it can do, uh, would otherwise have. Um, Obviously, to some extent, a mission like UNMIS is going to be dependent on the efficacy of its early warning systems. And I think many of the reports into UNMIS have drawn attention to issues relating to information flow and early warning. Uh, I, I should just say that that's not my experience. My experience is I'm awash with information. And information just pausing. It's really what we do with the information. That is a critical question. And we are having to look, I think, at early action rather than our early warning systems. And at the moment, as we speak, we're going through that precise exercise in regard to Yongle. We identified Yongle through a repeated pattern, a sick, annual cyclical uh, set of events which uh, signify, uh, firstly, the rising tensions and then the mobilization. We've used all the mechanisms we have to bring communities together, to bring youth groups together, to implicate uh, Juba elites in finding a solution in Yongle. And quite frankly, the jury is out. Uh, as we speak, the tensions are continuing to escalate. And for us, it's really quite a significant test. It's, it's a test of, our, as it were, our technologies of political intervention and uh, um, stabilization in an area noted for intercommunal tensions. So uh, just to, in a sense, underline what uh, Adam and his team had to say, uh, I, think, um, I think we're on the right track generally in, 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 in uh, our approaches to conflict. Uh, but the jury's out on how effective we can be, and we need to look at how to make our local agreements more effective, more enduring, uh, and uh, to ensure that they have the support of the government players. Um, they can't exist solely on the basis of UNMIS support. Um, I should mention on a positive side that our relations with the government of Sudan have improved significantly. And that has been manifest most obviously in the reduction of what we call access denials. Those are situations in which our patrols are denied access to certain areas. We are rapidly approaching the point where we have a zero rejection rate, which only six months ago had been closer to 40%. So we are uh, finding ourselves with uh, greater access to the areas, but much more importantly, able to open up that access to humanitarian workers. Uh, on the humanitarian uh, um, element of our five track uh, approach, uh, we should mention, we really can't let this uh, seminar go by without referring to the very troublesome phenomenon of youth-based uh, hostility and attacks on NGOs and humanitarians, not so much the UN per se, uh, but what is seen as a more privileged class, uh, frequently a foreign presence, even though the foreigners are other South Sudanese rather than um, non-South Sudanese uh, persons, uh, but it's creating a environment in which uh, humanitarians uh, in many cases are simply giving up. Uh, 
and withdrawing uh, from the terrain, um, but comes on top of a situation or circumstances in which South Sudan is already recognized as one of the most dangerous players, places to be hum a humanitarian worker. From our perspective, the challenge is how to respond to this manifestation of the marginalization, economic and political marginalization of the youth. And we don't think it can be done by silencing the youth. So it does and it begs uh, an engagement with the youth uh, while at the same time, uh, we have been quite clear in drawing a, li a line in the sand uh, in regard to attacks on humanitarian workers. We've indicated and we will continue to indicate that we will withdraw immediately. There are attacks on humanitarian workers and we will assist the humanitarian organizations to withdraw and they will not return until they get a firm and uh, uh, guarantee and promise uh, that there will be no violence um, visited on humanitarian workers. We will persist with that approach, but I think that shouldn't, um, that shouldn't be the four square walls uh, of our engagement with youth. I think we already recognize that UMNIS is, one of UMNIS's special responsibilities is going to have to be that the political processes set out in the AUKUS agreement are inclusive which in particular means that there is space for both the participation of women and youth in the election processes, monitoring processes, ceasefire processes, and certainly in the constitutional process. Let me just then end off looking at some of the difficult political benchmarks that I think we're gonna be facing uh, over the next year. The first one, of course, is elections. Uh, at this stage, let's be clear, we haven't had an invitation from the South Sudanese to help them organize elections. Um, the call for elections is beginning to emerge. There is some division and even within the presidency, uh, the individual vice presidents have different positions on whether the country is ready for elections or what uh, conditions must be met before elections can be held. But we do know that at the moment, the official or more formal uh, date that's been penciled in is for uh, the dry season next year, which is January, February, about a year away. And given the, you know, ordinarily the very difficult challenges in organizing elections in South Sudan, including logistic and security and so on, we're also conscious that the most important conditions which have to be met will be political. In other words, we need to head off an election which could be far from a nation building experience, a catastrophe. And it will be a catastrophe as there's violence before, during and after the elections. And the conditions that need to be created to head that scenario off are essentially political and have to be agreed by the South Sudanese, as I believe also uh, uh, applies to the selection of an election day. To be sure, the international community can uh, voice uh, and offer its advice on whether the conditions are present to hold the elections. But if the Sudanese were to agree as between them on the need to hold elections by February next year, they would be able to do it. Uh, if they were to work together. Uh, our concern, of course, is that uh, the electoral period will be manifest, will be associated with increased political competition, uh, tensions, intercommunal conflict, um, and will push those conditions uh, further back. In particular, uh, I should mention that we in UNMIS have used every opportunity to connect the necessity of an open political space before elections can be held. It's inconceivable that you can hold elections where uh, NGOs are harassed, where youth are told that they may not raise certain kinds of questions, where uh, there is generally a closure and shrinkage of political space. So we are certainly arguing with the government and with those that are willing to speak with us on this topic. And there are a number 
uh, of people who are willing to engage on it, that there needs to be an opening of political space uh, in Sudan uh, as a precondition for election. The other issue is the constitution. And uh, as Adam pointed out, the constitution is really a, an incredible opportunity for the country to uh, create some unity based on common aspirations, on shared values, uh, on an understanding of the arrangements by which a country with the fault lines which uh, South Sudan has can uh, live together in peace and harmony. We're worried by mumbling uh, to the effect that the constitution making process will hold up elections and that elections are the priority, in which case uh, we may yet see an argument that the constitution making process should be held off until after the elections. Uh, I think that would be an opportunity missed, uh, more especially because I think the constitutional debate also gives an opportunity to look at modalities, the way in which the prize uh, in a constitutional or political contest is divided uh, and shared uh, as between all groups, geographic groups, as well as uh, ethnic and other groups. Um, but as you're aware, there, I think it's fair to say they are behind uh, target uh, on engaging on that constitution making process. Again, uh, we would want to emphasize the UNMIS's role uh, in ensuring that that process is, a, is as inclusive as possible, rather than prescribing necessarily to South Sudanese what kind of constitution uh, they should best, uh, what constitutional choices they should make. Uh, constitution making is quintessentially a sovereign function. And uh, we would be more than willing to offer models and examples, but the choices and the political agreement behind any constitutional arrangement will have to be forged by the South Sudanese themselves. Um, overall, let me uh, suggest that uh, our troop ceiling is, in, is, is, is generally satisfactory and we have not uh, reached that ceiling as yet. Uh, we will be asking for um, additional increases in the size of the UNMIS uh, uh, presence, both civilian and military, but more of uh, an adjustment um, following the contraction which took place uh, uh, last year. We'll be looking at stronger police presences in Bentu and Molokal. Um, and again, just to uh, confirm Adam's suggestion, we will not be suggesting that Molokal be redesignated uh, at the moment. Um, we will be asking for a greater civilian presence, particularly in regard to elections uh, and the possibility um, of assisting at a technical level. Uh, finally, let me just um, address the issue of partnerships. Uh, what I like to say is that this whole uh, responsibility, which UNMIS uh, is quite frankly embracing both political peacekeeping and uh, and humanitarian is really too much for one organization. And we are reaching out and have reached out to EGAD and the AU to join us uh, in working shoulder to shoulder in assisting the South Sudanese reach the benchmark set out in Arcus. It's difficult, as you will be aware, EGAD is uh, really incapable at this stage of reaching a decision. It's critical players are barely talking to each other. Uh, that is not enough in our view to ignore EGAD. But what we are aware of is that if it fails to fill the space um, uh, in which um, it's supposed to occupy as uh, really the owner of the peace agreement and its guarantor, then really the African Union should be expected to step in and play a role, in our view, a more normative role um uh, would be the most productive uh, we believe it has real 
it has a real possibility to intervene and establish and call for the conditions which would be required for free and fair elections. Um, and we intend to work closely with the AU and EGAT in that regard. Quite frankly, we would uh, intend, we intend to work closely with the Troika, with the European Union, and with all other uh, agencies. We think that this is, in South Sudan is particularly a case in which collaboration and uh, joint action uh, could be very productive. Uh, and in that regard, I think we will certainly be assisting the San Egidio community, the Vatican, and the uh, Office of the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in their uh, attempts to play a constructive role uh, over the next year. I haven't discussed uh, the San Egidio initiative, that we can pick that up in questions, but that really concerns the issue of what can be done to extend the, re the reach of the peace agreement to what we often refer to as the holdout parties. And we think that there is a possibility for a role for the holdout parties, short of signing the agreements and coming, no longer being holdout parties. We think that it may be possible for them to work with and through the uh, jointly agreed ceasefire mechanisms and possibly even to participate in any constitutional process. And if they were to do that, then uh, we think that would pave, their way for, pave the way for their more fuller uh, political participation. Let me stop there, Cedric. Uh, there are issues which uh, people may want to pick up and identify specifically. Thank you very much, as far as Um I think that was a really comprehensive overview of, of progress achieved and challenges remaining and, and key areas that needs attention in the coming months. But now we are very keen to, to listen to Ambassador Kwai Bonamalwal, who is the permanent representative of South Sudan to the United Nations. Ambassador, we're very keen to, to hear your reaction to what you heard, as well as your own views of, of what the priorities of UNMIS should be in the, in the coming year. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Cedric, and uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, let me actually thank the Norwegian in uh, Institute for International Affairs for uh, and the authors of this report, which is actually, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Heisem, that is, is good, comprehensive. And uh, it's, I think it's timely because uh, this coming year or the renewal of the mandate, I think it's an opportunity that uh, perhaps should not be missed. I agree with uh, Professor Heisem that there is a lot of progress that has been achieved, and, uh, but more can be done. And I think uh, next year with the talk of elections, and there are a lot of things that are not in place, and uh, the reason the agreement is actually going on a slow pace, it's because the international community has left it for the, the government or for the leadership of South Sudan to implement it on their own. And uh, the report talks about a lot of uh, obstacles like capacity building, and uh, financing and, uh, and uh, an economy that is actually uh, uh, dropping by the day. So I don't see actually uh, in terms of uh, us next year having in terms of the election, because I think that's the most important thing that is uh, in front of us now. Uh, if the politicians, the leadership, the political leadership, uh, although they are uh, staying in Juba, working together, and but I think there is a bit, uh, there is a lack of warmth that makes it difficult for the implementation to be implemented uh, by the timetable that is on there. So you will see the same thing if we have a delay in 
certain uh, provisions of the agreement that are moving slowly. Then we have a situation that next year, you will find a division in the country where people will say, we want elections. The others say, no, we are not ready. We cannot have elections. There are a lot of people say maybe election would be the best way to really put the country back into order and to move into the national uh, unity or national development that uh, has been lacking for the last uh, 10 years, let's say. Now, in the report, you the report is a bit uh, not warm about the nation building, but really, uh, when we talk about uh, nation building in South Sudan, it's not that we want it to be uh, to catch up with the first world country, but we are talking about basic fundamental foundation that should be put in place to uh, let everybody uh, be in the region to be getting some services that are uh, needed, especially now if we say a lot of uh, refugees and IDPs have gone back to their uh, region and to their villages and to their homes. But if you go and you are not getting the service that you used to get in the POCs, then also you are creating now uh, uh, a situation where people are leaving their villages and they're coming to Juba or going to the big cities where they think they can get uh, that. But if we could really provide certain services. And I know people say the government is the primary responsibility for this, but if we are engaged, we have UNAMIS, we have the international community that is concerned about a sustainable peace agreement. I think their intervention is needed here. And Dr. Hassan talked about the World Bank report saying, if we get into a nation building, it will take you 40 years. But our fear is that we don't want the UN to be with us for 40 years, trying to put our communities together. We want to reunite, put the peace agreement together and so that we can really uh, take care of our own affairs as soon as possible. But if we go like this, if the international community is keeping their hands off, thinking that the political leadership will be uh, get together and build their own country, then the UN and the international and the NGOs will be with us for the next 40 years, if not more. That's what we don't want to do. So I am for actually a, a little uh, program of putting fundamental uh, uh, basis that will let the government now uh, provide certain services for the people, especially if people are leaving the refugee camps. And uh, the mandate that is and uh, that is supposed to be uh, renewed. Uh, that it, we talked about also, and when I say we, I mean South Sudanese among ourselves. When we uh, the question, the big presence of the international community, and yet they are leaving us alone. Not. We don't see the results, as they say. I know there is, uh, since the last two years or three years, the political violence has been uh, substantially reduced. And but you have now what you call the, the subnational uh, conflict, which is uh, at, uh, not all the subnational conflicts, by the way, are uh, instigated by the politician in Juba. These are, there are certain traditional uh, residue of how we used to do things and people now, if the government is not present, then we go back to our traditional fighting and cattle wrestling and all that. But I agree also, once those happens in the region, they also revert back to Juba because you have to get involved with your community and see, and therefore that might be now part of where the politician will be, uh, involved in. But I really think the next uh, uh, the mandate should uh, have a little elements of nation building. Uh, also, the elections are the most important thing. I don't see anything more 
that will, uh, if it's not handled with care, I agree with Dr. Hysham that uh, it's a situation where anything that we have achieved so far can come unraveling if we are not really uh, putting all the mechanism, all the, uh, uh, the dots that are needed for a true, Dr. Hassan talks about, uh, yeah, normally I think that's what uh, a sovereign country does to invite the international community to come and monitor uh, their elections. I hope this will be the case that if we all agree, all the, the, the political parties that have signed to the peace agreement, if they agree, then of course they will uh, come now and say invite. But there are people who say, no, we don't need the international community. We will run our own elections. And that's where the problem will start. I don't know what the international community will do at the time. You don't want to be sitting back after the facts when things get unraveled. And you say, oh, well, we could have uh, done something at the time. It's the same thing in 2013 when people were, there were a lot of uh, rumbling about the uh, the political tension until it exploded. And then everybody was, <laughs> I wish we had uh, seen this coming uh, when people were talking about the tension between the vice president and the president or their camps. We don't want this to happen during the election. So I think the election is a crucial uh, time for South Sudan. It, it will uh, show us in the international community Either we are building the peace agreement to move forward or actually what we have been doing now has not actually cemented and that's very dangerous. We don't want to go back into uh, the violent uh, years that we have done. And the third thing actually, I have always talked about capacity building. Without capacity building, look what capacity building does. In the contournement, if you don't have uh, the reason that the, the army is not uh, graduated and not unified because they don't have uh, all the facilities, the thing that will actually, the good facility to uh, the camps to train them. We have always said that we need, we don't need the money. We need the, the know-how, the expertise, how you can now bring a warring army together so that they can really work as a, a national army. If you leave it to South Sudanese alone, then even within the cantonment camp, the IG will be on their own, the IO on their own, the other political parties on their own. And in the absence of uh, lack of financial support to the camps, people go for a week or two weeks. When you get stuff, you move and you go back where you came from. So that's the situation where I think we need help in that one. But if we are left alone, I don't know. I am not sure if we, whether we will have really uh, uh, a peaceful uh, election next year. I don't even know uh, our uh, election commission. This morning I was talking about how the election commission itself need capacity building, need to be uh, prepared to really run elections the right way and the, uh, the, the more ac acceptable international or regional way. This has to start now. I think a year is not that long. We will, before we know it, we're gonna be in July. And then I don't know what the international community is going to say if we say, okay, we are not ready. We don't want election. I know here in the Security Council, there are people who want elections. And, uh, and if we as a government say we are not ready, then they will think, oh, we are not showing political will and uh, this is a delaying tactics and all, and then all the accusation will come again. So I really think that uh, there is a need for the mandate to have more involved, of course, with not imposed on the people of South Sudan, but we need to be engaged, the leadership of South Sudan with the international uh, community leadership to see how best we could really go through, if we're gonna go through elections next year, then this is how we are going to help you to have your election in a very transparent manner. Or if you assess that we are not ready, then also we could sit down with the international community and tell us no. In order to have a conflict-free elections, and I think we should, this is our opportunity. 
why should all African elections be conflict ridden? Why can't we all prepare this election so that actually to show that we could Africa could do elections in a in a very uh, peaceful manner? It's an opportunity, and I think we shouldn't let that happen. But if we leave us to our own devices, I'm afraid we will have a very bumpy uh, ride uh, next year because there are two people, two camps, those who want the election and those who don't want elections. But as you, as we said that the elections need uh, a preparation. But in terms of the report, the report covers everything, except that uh, it was 2018. I'm sure by now uh, certain things have happened. And, uh, but also we hope that uh, you are uh, keeping close eye on our situation and you will come back from time to time. So I thank you very much for this. And then we will cover, uh, if there are any questions, we will open to the other areas that maybe I didn't touch on. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for that uh, very important perspective. I'm afraid we only allocated uh, one hour to this session today. So we, we soon running out of our time, but I think you, you raised a very important point around the, the balance that we need to strike between, on the one hand, leaving you know, maximum space for the South Sudanese to, to determine their own future. And at the same time, you are raising the, the need for uh, international support uh, and uh, a, a mission that has the mandate to provide that support that is requested and that can contribute uh, the services that are needed to to help bring that forward. So I think that that does put uh, that is very difficult to strike that balance exactly right. But I think that is a, a critically important point that you raise, and maybe in that context and also in the context of of the comments that has been made about the challenges that EGAD face at the moment and and maybe the the need for the African Union to step in. I just want to ask Andrew if he has any additional thoughts about what the role of the African Union should then be in this particular context uh, in the coming year. Uh, thank you very much, Cedric. And I think the, the ambassador said it quite rightly. I, I think where, for me, where the AU could play a role, and particularly is, as I said, in that area of synergy with, with EGAD. Um, and, and that partnership, needs, we need to see more of that partnership, that communication. But also, I would argue, uh, looking at more, or should I say, ways of stabilizing. So how can the AU in conjunction with EGAD complement one another, but also help to stabilize and move things forward in Sudan? So this is really about resource sharing, uh, the technical capacity as the ambassador has highlighted, but also thinking about the you know post-conflict reconstruction uh, program that is in place with the AU. How can some of that work that has been done on the ground already uh, filter through into South Sudan uh, and, and beyond. Um, I know there was a question on chapter five, and it's important to note that the reason why there were delays is because obviously it's an initial parties were not, or should I say, some of the parties were not part of the initial agreement, so they had to go back and forth. And so this has caused some delays, but applying that pressure is important. Uh, but I also think- Sorry, Let me stop you there. Thank you so much for, for that. That's really excellent. I want to just use the last minute or two to go back to Ambassador Malwell. And uh, Ambassador um, SRSG Haysom also raised the important role of the youth. And uh, of course, there's many voices that also ask for a new generation of politicians to emerge in, in, in South Sudan. What is your views about the role of the youth and how the youth can be engaged in, in building peace and, and, and uh, really playing a leading role in the future of South Sudan? Of course, I mean, uh, I think it's important. I think our problem now is that uh, the, uh, the, the older generation is refusing to give way to the youth. And the only way actually the youth can get an opportunity to participate is this, is that if we have a peaceful way that may be moderated by the international community so that the youth and the women are allowed to have a bigger role in the next election and to have a transition into leadership. And, and, and that's one of the things also the youth now, yeah, they can talk, but they don't really get into the position of leadership on their own because there are no mechanisms that allow for that transition to happen. And that cannot happen within South Sudan alone. It has to be pushed from outside in a, way, in a, in a partnership manner, not in a dictatorship manner. So of course, I, the youth, have a, they have a big role to play and they should play a, a big role next election 
it shouldn't be the same faces. I think I'm saying this because I know we have to have new faces and that's the purpose of elections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We've run out of time, colleagues and, and participants. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us for this, uh, for this webinar. Isharas G. Haysom, Ambassador Malwell, Dr. Adam Day, Dr. Andrew Chi, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much everyone for your participation. And uh, we look forward to see how the mandate uh, is, is uh, uh, adapted and adopted in, in March. And I, we all look forward and wish South Sudan well in this uh, coming year and will accompany the process uh, very closely. So thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.